Hi, I'm Joe. Um, like most of you here know me. Um, yeah, speaking in front of colleagues is way more terrifying than speaking in front of uh, a crowd full of strangers. Um, so yeah, I work at Parity and I'm going to talk about uh, Parathreads, which is our new idea um, on Polkadot. Uh, before we go into like Parathreads, does everybody here have an idea what Polkadot is? Like parachains, everybody's at that level already? <laughs> you already understand. <laughs> okay, so um, Polkadot is a network for blockchains to interoperate with each other, um, provide shared security, and interchain communication. Um, so, yes, we do this via parachains, um, which are the chains that can communicate on Polkadot. And so the benefits of being a parachain are that you get security, um, you don't have to worry about uh, building a validator set or consensus algorithms, it's all, all the finalization is done through Polkadot. Um, interoperability, you can send arbitrary messages and receive arbitrary messages from other chains in the system. And high throughput, um, so uh, Polkadot has a six second block time and your chain can have also a six second block time. You can only advance with the relay chain. Um, but being a parachain basically gives you the right to uh, propose a block every six seconds. Um, for every block in the relay chain, you can put a block in on your parachain. Um, <clears throat> so you're basically guaranteed to always have validators connected to you, ready to accept your next block. Um, the cost of being a parachain is that you have to bond tokens. Um, and it's expected to be quite high. Um, dots are not really meant to be a super liquid token. Um, so we think each parachain could be about 20 to 40,000 dots. Um, <clears throat> which kind of brings us to a problem that not everybody can raise that much money. Um, and you can, we do provide a module for uh, crowdfunding so people can loan dots to your application and to raise enough so you don't have to necessarily have all these yourself and they don't get spent, you get them back at the end, it's just a bond. Um, but also not everybody actually needs this six second block time. And so uh, instead of like, Polkadot can only support a quite limited number of parachains, and so since not everybody needs this maximum throughput, um, we thought about, or Gav thought about, how we can share some of this throughput. Um, so that brings us to parathreads. A uh, good analogy is that they're like applications on disk that can be copied into memory when you need them, and Polkadot's uh, quote-unquote operating system schedules processes with an auction, and so um, what this means is parachains are basically like applications that are in memory, in RAM. You, they're always accessible. Um, anytime they want to schedule something, they have access to the CPU. Um, and you can only fit so many applications in memory, but you can fit, relatively speaking, unlimited applications on disk. And so these applications on disk can participate in an auction and like basically ask the operating system to be let in, um, except instead of just kind of asking and saying, yeah, here you go, you have to actually pay for this. Um, they're basically parachains, technically speaking. They have exactly the same API. Um, they get the security. They can interoperate with other parachains, with other parathreads. Um, they can switch between parachains and parathreads um, because, yeah, they're basically the same. The only difference is that they're not bonding this really large number of dots to be a parathread. Um, and instead, they pay per block. So you pay a, a really small bond, like 50 or 100 dots, um, and then you, instead of always being connected to the validators and being able to execute a block whenever you want to, you have to pay for every block that you execute. And that is not a bond that you're actually paying. Um, and then you can only progress your chain when you execute a block in the relay chain. Um, and so it's a different economic model, like on a pair of chain, you're, putting up a very large amount of money uh, at the beginning, and then you're gonna get it all back, but there's obviously an opportunity cost with that. Um, you could do other things with those tokens, uh, like nominate a validator or uh, rage quit Polkadot and take something else. Um, and here you're paying a much smaller amount, but you're actually paying this money per block. Um, so yeah, the economics, how this auction actually works um, is that Every time, every block of the relay chain, there's an auction for a pair of threads. And so the winners of this auction can submit a block for the next relay chain block. And so you can see there's already some latency here. So not only are you not getting to execute a block every block, 
But when you win a, an auction, you have to still wait for the next block um, before you can actually submit your block. And so, I mean, the reason is there's kind of some like context switching going on here. Um, there's a lot of like networking overhead in Polkadot when it comes to routing messages and connecting validators. So your pair thread or pair chain is going to have a network of collators who submit blocks to the validators. And they're going to have a DHT of inside themselves, like how they find each other. And then when all the validators go to find a pair chain, they kind of have to find your collators and open a connection with them. And so every relay chain block, there's an auction and it says, you know, okay, like these pair threads have won. And then before the next, before their block can execute, there's all this context switching that has to go on that um, can basically connect the validators to these pair threads. Um, but then you're connected to a validator and you can submit a block um, on the relay chain. And so how, so you're submitting this, you're, uh, sorry, you're submitting these bids in dots and how do you get those dots? You have a few options. One is a dot reserve. So pair threads and chains can have their own accounts in Polkadot. So you can have like a, a dot account that belongs to a chain. And so one way to do this was to just have the chain uh, through some fundraising mechanism raise say, I don't know, uh, 5,000 dots or whatever, put it in this account, and then via some governance mechanism, you could say, you know, every uh, 100 relay chain blocks, our collators are, are allowed to take five dots he from here in order to bid in the auction. Um, another way would be native token inflation. So you could say um, every block since the last time we executed a block in the relay chain, we're going to increase our inflation or our block reward by a little bit to the collators. And um, once that block reward gets high enough, and then assuming there is some sort of exchange between your native token and dot tokens, um, once those tokens are worth more than the dots that are required to win the auction, um, those collators can just take those native tokens, win the auction, exchange it for dots. Um, those are the only two ideas that I've come up with. So I put a third one uh, if somebody has a good idea. Um, however you want to get dots to win these auctions, that is your call. Um, so just an example of these um, auctions, you have like a pool of pair of threads, none of them are connected to validators and they're all bidding. So um, you get multiple collators on each pair of thread and they're all making bids and dots to the relay chain validators to include a block. And here you can see that Alice, Dave and Fred have won the auction. Um, Eve does not because you can only get one, um, one block per chain. So third place goes to Dave here. Um, but yeah, that's how the auction works. And then once you win the auction, you connect to some validators and you can submit your block for uh, execution. Um, so what applications are these good for? Um, I think there's like three major categories. Um, one is an on-ramp to Polkadot. So this is, we've kind of talked about that you just don't have enough funds to raise like 30,000 dots to be a parachain. And so um, you start out as a pair thread and once your application gains adoption and gets a lot of users and maybe you can raise the money after that um, to become a full parachain. Um, the other way is off-ramp. So one of the concerns people have had building on Polkadot is okay, I want to interoperate with these other chains. Um, you know, what if I'm using like an identity chain or whatever, and then it loses its parachain slot. Um, now my application is just kind of like up the creek. What do I do? Um, this gives you an off ramp. So that chain that's losing its parachain slot, it could just downgrade and be a parachain or a pair of thread. And then um, it's not quite as fast or performance, but it's still there and maybe it works just fine without the performance um, or maybe it just gives you the time to find something different. Um, and then this kind of like goes into just a nice feature is that they can swap. So normally a pair of chain is locked into a bond for like up to two years. And so a pair of thread can just come in and say, hey, I'll buy you out of your bond. So if you've bonded 30,000 dots and you, uh, you're halfway through your lease and you say, uh, I don't want to wait another year to get my dots back. Um, you can find a pair of thread who will just take that over and give you your dots back. Um, so it gives you like a nice uh, mechanism to switch without like being limited to these two year cycles. Um, and then the third type of application that 
I think is interesting is applications where reads are much greater than writes. Um, so this is stuff that doesn't need a six second block time. So I think there's gonna be a lot of oracles, like there could be a daily price oracle, like uh, I mean like the futures markets in America close at like 4, 15 p.m. or something. So you could have, you know, what's the Bitcoin futures price at, that close at today? Um, that's once every 24 hours or maybe um, an oracle that's just posting every time there's a Bitcoin block header. So um, like a bridge chain, we we don't want the bridge chain to accept collateral until we're like pretty confident that that block won't be reverted. So the bridge chain might actually operate like say six blocks behind the chain tip of Bitcoin. Uh, but you can have an oracle that just every time it gets a new block from the Bitcoin network, it just kind of announces to the world like, hey, uh, here's a new block on Bitcoin. Uh, that's only once every 10 minutes. Um, something like DNS, or I guess like there's ENS now, um, perfectly reasonable to update this registry once every hour, but people are reading from it all the time. And so there's no need for a six second block time. And these kind of applications are just perfect as a pair of thread. Um, there's no reason to have access to the validators all the time for every single block when you're only submitting a block every 10 minutes or every hour or every day. Um, and then kind of how this changes Polkadot is um, we see like probably 10 to 30 infrastructure chains and these are just granted by governance. So um, bridges to other chains, staking. We would like to have um, a transactionless relay chain. So right now the relay chain handles uh, dot token transfers between uh, accounts and between parachains. Um, we would really like the, the relay chain blocks to only carry the uh, POV blocks proof of validity. Um, that's basically the attestations that the parachains have executed correctly. Um, so we don't even want to put dot transfers. We'd like to have a parachain that's like just dot transfers, a parachain for staking, a uh, parachain for governance. And so um, these things are just kind of granted as part of the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, and then we'll have a set of parachain slots that are privately operated. And so these would be like private chains, but they're, we expect very high throughput. So like a decentralized exchange or a stable coin um, these you would expect that they're having heavy traffic inbound and outbound every single block. Um, so it makes sense for them to be a parachain and just always have access to the network. Um, and then a pool of parathreads, or maybe 50 of them can execute every block, but maybe you can have 500 or 1,000 parathreads in this pool. Um, and that just opens up Polkadot to a lot more applications. Um, yeah, and then uh, we got this nice pretty graphic of Polkadot with uh, like the parachains and bridges and the, the pool of parathreads executing. Um, and I think that was it. Um, so yeah, I like questions more, so I did a short presentation and if you guys have questions, then uh, we can do that. Yeah, Dennis? Should I have the mic? <clears throat> What's the maximum throughput of uh, Yeah, the, the question was what's the maximum throughput of pair of threads? Uh, it's exactly the same as a pair of chain. So, well, per block, it's exactly the same as a pair of chain. So you can execute up to the weight that's allowed by Polkadot. Um, and then I guess if you win every single auction, then you're basically the same throughput as a pair of chain. Um, it's up to you how many auctions you decide to bid competitively in. And uh, can we be DDoSed by multiple barrel threads on the maximum throughput? Yeah, the question is if we can be DDoSed by multiple pair of threads on the, multiple, on the, uh, on the maximum throughput. Uh, I think it depends on how many pair of threads we allow. So we just say like, okay, we're only allowing 10 pair of threads to execute. And then, yeah, we can we, the polka dot side is what controls the throughput, not the pair of thread side. Um, and wow, what else was I gonna say on that? Oh yeah, I guess like the one risk is that there's, they're not completely zero overhead because there's still the interchain message passing which takes place outside of the relay chain. And so you still have to collect ingress and egress uh, messages for those pair of threads. Um, so they're not zero overhead even if they're not executing, but um, much lower. Any more questions? No? Thanks. Okay. Thank you.